part of the swearing was homophobic. We needed people who understood what discrimination looked like and how to challenge people uh, in a fair but fierce way. Grief, you don't get over grief, your life adapts to it. And so I was diagnosed with long COVID after about six weeks by my local practice and referred to the long COVID clinic in Derbyshire. Today I'm talking to Sarah Barlow McMullen. I found this introduction really, really difficult because Sarah has such a richness and variety in her life that I just don't feel that the words I could actually convey could do her justice. We've spoken for over an hour. We've talked about her life as a vicar's daughter. We've spoken about coming out as gay and her marriage to her lovely wife. We've spoken about what Pride in Belper meant and the, the violence behind the reason for bringing Pride in Belper to the town. We've spoken about her passions and her commitments and her community, the loss of her brother and her father, which affected her dearly. And then to top it all, this year has been a real difficult year in terms of contracting COVID in January and now suffering from long COVID. Some of the health things have, have made her have to change the way that she is. But deep down, she is Sarah. And we talked about being a leader without a title because Sarah is so much in herself and so strong and so passionate that actually a title just doesn't do her justice. I hope you enjoy the next hour. It's, it's been an absolute revelation and an eye opener to me and I hope that you find it equally as valuable. So today, please welcome Sarah Barley McMullen. Hi Sarah, thank you for letting me into your great little studio room. You're very welcome. It's nice to be able to use it for something different. Yeah, actually. absolutely. So this great little garden room is your um, pottery room, is it? Or glass. Glass room. Glass. glass sorry. Yeah. Mm, glass glass studio. Yeah, so we've got a kiln over there and um, lots and lots of uh, glass paraphernalia all over the place. Um, and it's... It, it's it's something that we always dreamed of having really i've got a music studio the other side which is a third of the size but <coughs> yeah it's great space yeah it really is so i wanted to talk to you today um really about a variety of things i i really not struggled but in my head you're such you're probably the most diverse person that i actually know in my life and the podcast obviously is about my local people yeah. and to talk about different um, activities and things that people might have struggled with throughout their lives and got them to where they are today and yeah. the activities and the strategies that they've used to help move them forward. Okay. And I could have picked, in fact, we could probably do a whole series of podcasts on some of the <laughs> things in, we in your life, but probably, yeah, <laughs> we, might, we might just leave it at the one for now in, okay. in this series anyway. Okay. Um, so for those who aren't aware, um, currently you're off work with long COVID. I am. Um, which we will touch on. And, okay. Because uh, I think that's a really important thing to sort of put, put a stick in the ground to measure where we are. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to also talk to you, your, your chair of Belper Pride or Pride in Belper. Pride in Belper, yeah. Yep. So yeah, not Belper Pride, sorry. No, Pride no, Belper. no, absolutely. Deliberately called Pride in Belper so that everybody could feel part of it, mm. really. Um, which has always been the premise. And this year online again as it was last year due to the covid situation yeah yeah it was it was a shame but it it it, it enabled us still to get something out there and involve as many people as we could and although one day was online um we still had as much visible support throughout the town as as we could mm. so we still <coughs> um had all the um flags down the market uh, down the high street so we have the progress flags which include the trans mm. colors and black and brown for anti-racism um and we encourage shops to get involved in pride of place um parties to do window displays and i wrote to every school every company medical center dentist in belper and said this is what we're doing here are some resources please use them mm. um, but please contribute in some way so we had over 200 pictures drawn by um, primary school children in the window at the co-op. 
um, and similarly in Morrison's. Um, and we had oh, just all, all kinds of people getting in touch saying, can we talk about our faith and belief and being LGBT? Um, can we talk about um, uh, working with children in an inclusive and accessible way? Um, we, we had lots and lots of different uh, people um, coming forward and music, so lots of lots of performances. It was nothing though compared to um, the Pride event that we had, the face-to-face -face event um, three years ago, but it, it couldn't be any more than it was mm -hmm. in, in our mind. And I think we were right to do that because COVID's quite quite high again in Belper at the moment. Mm. So, and it was all I could really do as well. Sure. So, as you mentioned, the first sort of three years ago, yeah. uh, first Pride in Belper was a, an amazing event. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about what your vision behind Pride in Belper was. Oh, that's that's really interesting. I think my my background has always been. Um, so my first degree is in community work and youth work and that's the main degree that I then went on to, to teach on as a senior lecturer. So my heart has always been in um, a sort of community engagement model and everybody um, getting involved in something or as many people as possible. And I suppose that's, that's where I'd bring some of my church, my faith origins in as well. I very much, for different reasons, separate my faith and the church um, because I'm, I'm a gay woman um, and that's how I make it work for me, but that's, that's another conversation. Um, but I was at an event in, in a community hall in Belper um, that I felt really inspired by. It was um, <coughs> uh, a, a group of people had decided to make 3D models of um, influential women across Britain and um, someone from Belper who runs Accessible Belper um, had been chosen mm. and a 3D model had been made. And I just got talking to these um, people. I forget the charity they were from. And I suddenly thought this is, this is absolutely brilliant because what they're doing is they are making visible in a long lasting way, um, not just the person, but the, the, the work that that person has stood for. Or, or made more visible. And so I came home and said to Helen, my wife, um, I think we should have a pride, a pride event in Belper, just a picnic mm. in the Memorial Gardens. And uh, she said, OK, well, that, that, that would be good. Um, you need a decent team around you. So Helen's the strategist and I'm the ideas person. And so I picked people that I... Um, I got on well with um, and who I know knew would challenge me and I would be able to challenge back if need be and so there were there were about seven or eight of us um, and um, we said look let's do this um, and, and we said yeah okay let's do this I then left it for a while but was walking home from the pub um, on my own and I, I walk with a, a crutch um, because of some mobility issues that I have and um, <clears throat> there was a big fight at the end of my road so I stood back and waited and the fight moved into the park so I then started headed off towards my house when suddenly somebody um, covered in blood squared up to me swore at me and um, part of the swearing was homophobic and I was terrified. Mm. But as soon as that person had squared up to me, two people stood either side of me that I didn't know. And somebody stood next to this person that had been abusive and threatening. Um, and they pulled them away. And the two people that flanked me either side of me um, said, do you know this, this person? I said, no. And they said, right come on we'll walk you home where do you live so mm. I told them and they and I didn't know them and, mm. the, and they literally walked me to my door and I sat and I was shaking and I I thought wow those those people the kindness of those people have just got me out of a really awful situation um there isn't mass homophobia in 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 
helper mm. what what we need is is to bring the community together and show that actually everybody um every everybody's life is important and we actually probably need a bit more visibility mm. so I, I sent a tweet out and just just put pride in belper um are you ready for this people and set up a facebook page and said the same thing and got like after like after like after like and it was really it really was just going to be a picnic in the park but the community wouldn't let it be that small so people kept getting in touch saying so and so would like to um come and and talk at, at at the event are you having stalls we'd like to perform we'd like to sell our pottery um we've we've got a crepe van that we'd like to bring um the local cinema said we'd like to put put some um, LGBT films on one of the films Pride is a true story around uh, um, a, a group of miners and the LGBT community that supported the miners strike and one of the characters or, or one of the, the people that one of the characters was based on um, got in touch and said here you're showing that that film as part of Pride I'd like to come and mm. you know introduce it and do a Q&A around it and it just got bigger and bigger to the point where we actually ended up having a march down the high street. The university bought flags that were down the high street. We had food vans. We had you did the sound and, and all the performance mm. stuff for us on the stage, which was fabulous. Um, and then we'd we'd had a, a beer brewed to distribute around all the pubs to try and normalise the event with the pubs because the police, we had to get the police involved because the road um, had to be closed. Um, the police were really worried about the reaction from pubs. So we got this beer brewed and then Helen and I <coughs> drove around the 22 pubs in Belpa and distributed um, uh, beer mats with Pride in Belpa. And that's what the brew had been called um, and gave them contact details of how to get this beer um, in. And uh, as soon as we heard that uh, the Greenhouse pub uh, which is probably the biggest pub in Belper, um, was in and had got an ABBA tribute uh, gig that night, we knew we would be fine and mm. the police knew that we'd be fine. Um, so it grew into an event where I hoped a couple of hundred people would come to the police. The police said that there was a minimum of 5,000 people that actually came to the event. Mm. Um, we had we had no money really. We, we got a, a small grant from the local council. Um, individual an individual gave us uh, five hundred pounds in memory of his partner, um, which still gives gives me goosebumps now. And we did a crowdfunder, so we had about two thousand mm. pounds, and we we put put it all on um, with all the health and safety requirements. Helen did a huge events plan, and um, over twenty volunteers marshalling the streets but i th but i think you know the event was was something incredible in its own right but it did so many more things that was that were longer lasting than just the day and i think that's what when i faced um that it wasn't an attack but that abuse in the street i knew something different needed to happen and something needed to be more visible in the yeah. town and we started getting messages from people saying, I've been in a relationship um, with another man for 45 years and I, I kissed them for the first time visibly on the high street at Pride. Or trans people walking down the high street before the event mm. and saw trans flags hanging outside shops walk down in tears because they felt mm. seen for the first time in their hometown. Um, someone came up to me and said, last time I walked down this street, um, I was I was actually running from someone who was beating me up for being a lesbian. Mm. And and she said, and now I've just I've just walked down um, waving my rainbow flag, proud as punch mm. um, that, that I'm here. You know, so just little anecdotes like that. And your whole families were there with their small children and just normalizing difference. And what we wanted to do was um, 
enable the whole community to to feel involved which is why we called it pride in belper not belper pride Mm. so yes it was about um raising up the visibility of the lgbt plus community um but it was it was about everybody sharing in a celebration so visually we had all the the uh, rainbow trans bi pansexual flags um etc out there and we had drag kings and queens and people were dressing up and but but actually it it was about normalizing and making um it was it was about leveling up not not in the tory government sense of the word but it was about leveling up mm-hmm. inclusion and equality through visibility and you know changing attitudes and and you know it it had a huge impact mm-hmm. a huge impact being part of it for me yeah. it was yeah ab- absolutely and i've i've got you know, similar anecdotal stories where people have, um, one of our friends, he, he said, it's the most welcome he's ever felt in his hometown. Yeah. And, you know, so so yeah. similarly, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was a fantastic day. And I, I can remember coming away from the stage to watch the march go past because I knew that, you know, we'd got sort of 20 minutes, half an hour before they were going to reach and we were, the first act was going on. And I can remember feeling emotional and tears yeah. and it was just and, and even now I can you know yeah. it yeah. takes me back to that moment as probably one of the proudest yeah. things that I've done in my life and yeah. and so to hear the community ethic that you know that you've just sort of laid yeah. out before us yeah I can agree and I yeah. can I can fully see that that has borne some great fruit yeah well I mean and and that's fabulous that's fabulous to hear, hear that take on it I mean I think you know as an academic, I'd put theory in there as well, and mm. I'd talk about community development theory, which comes from the grassroots. So, you know, people don't reject things, that, that ideas that they come up with themselves very often. So listening to the community and being open to the community, and when I say they wouldn't let, the community wouldn't let it be as small as we planned, mm. we listened to them and... Um, the, the, the final version of the event was what the community had asked for. So that was, you know, some community development theory. <clears throat> Our approach, though, as well, took a, a social pedagogy theory, which is um, social pedagogy is about education and care, usually for vulnerable um, young it's one people. One of my favourite words, ped- pedagogy. Pedagogy, or pe- <laughs> pedagogy, as some people call it. <laughs> the first lecture is always how to pronounce pedagogy, mm. pedagogy. Um but one of the theories in that talks about um, um, a, a professional working with somebody, um, somebody else in in care or um, a patient um, in a in a mutually respectful way. But it talks about um, three aspects: the education and care comes from your head, your heart, and your hands. Mm. So your head is the the intellect and and the the knowledge that you have around what will work and what won't work so we needed all the planning in there we needed the the technical sound expertise we <clears throat> we needed people who understood what discrimination looked like and how to challenge people uh, in a fair but fierce way mm. um the the heart bit is is the compassion and the empathy so it wasn't about shutting out um heterosexual people it was about saying this is a this this is heterosexuality is the the main norm in this town. Let's level it up a bit. Let's mm. let's involve everybody else for one day mm. on the same level. Um, so there was the compassion and the empathy uh, and the engagement and the relationship building. And then the hands bit, the head, heart, hands is the getting out there and doing it mm. and you know doing it as well as you possibly could. And I'm a great networker. Um, so I I brought as many people in and, and, and took on as many opportunities to engage and involve other people as I possibly could. Um, and when people said that they wanted a different role or they they would like to be involved in some way, then uh, we, we involved them. But I always remember we could only afford <laughs> to buy um, T-shirts for nine people. Um, <laughs> That's how tight the budget was. Um, you got a, you got a I black got one. Hair. You got the black one, didn't Second you? Black, that's yeah, funny. yeah. <laughs> I, I got the red one. And I was very proud of that. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know, for me, it had to have that that underpinning really to give it credibility. And 
from that, we've developed a, a series of, of pillars. Um, and they, they develop very quickly, which is just values, really. Mm. Um, and they're about sustainability, um, you know, in terms of the, ne- the event that we were organising just before the pandemic hit and the first lockdown hit in 2020 we were going to ask people to bring their own cups or beakers or plates or mm. or um cutlery so that there wasn't any that that any of the vendors had to bring for themselves um you know you bring mess take your own mess away and lots of signage but lots of bins and water stations so that people could fill their own bottles up mm. and things like that um so sustainability accessibility making it as accessible an event as possible so that people with agoraphobia people with mental health um, conditions people with invisible disabilities and visible disabilities felt as enabled and as welcome and as included as people that could access all of those things Mm. and that takes a lot of work Um, inclusivity and for me inclusivity is not about tolerance we tolerate dog muck on the street don't we it's there and we hate it it's not even about acceptance because we can accept the fact that dogs poo on the street Mm. um it's about welcoming um so it goes far beyond acceptance it's about making sure everybody felt welcome so for me it wasn't about the lgbt community shouting down the straight community it was about welcoming everybody in exactly the same way so that straight people felt welcome in the same way that trans or or pansexual or bisexual or gay people felt welcome um and then diversity you know we've got such an incredible we talk about Belfast being a really diverse town but actually in terms of ethnicities it isn't Mm. um and that's that's because we need to be more welcoming so so people of different ethnicities um won't or hadn't come to Belper because they didn't feel welcome, they didn't feel included or as though they could belong. Um, and that is starting to change a little bit. Mm. But the fabulous thing, a few weeks after that big Pride event in uh, 2019, was that we were, we'd were we made it, Belper as a town had made it to the <coughs> uh, final of the Great British High Street. And I was asked as, as chair of Pride in Belper um, to meet um, with some of the judges. So I got this sheet together of all the social media feedback and evaluation that people had, had just um, yeah. offered up. And I, I met them outside a shop and talked to them about, said, our values, sustainability, accessibility, inclusivity and diversity and how we'd done it and what we'd done. And there was an acknowledgement that Pride in Belper shifted us um, to win. Yeah. So we won... Great British, you know, it wasn't just us by any stretch of the imagination, but we had that edge. There was no other small town. It gave it a foundation. Yeah, absolutely. For the rest to be built on. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And, and, you know, there was a couple of the judges had been involved in other Pride events, but big ones around the the country, because this is one of the unusual things about this is this is just a regular everyday um, cotton mill town, Mm. you know, that, that doesn't have things like Pride. Um, so that you know that was incredible Um, more recently we were nominated for the National Diversity Awards and um, incredibly um, we were shortlisted to one of uh, eight finalists in the LGBT Community of the Year Award out of 52,000 entries and one of one of the issues I have with long COVID is that I can't cry. It's affected my central nervous system, and that's what some of my voices as well. Um, so I get goosebumps, uh, but I can't actually cry. Um, but reading some of the nominations for Pride in Belper, it was it was grandparents talking about how it had changed their grandchildren's lives. It, it was it was single parents um, and it was same sex parents talking about how more how safe how much more safe they felt in the community. It was trans people being able to talk openly about the transphobia that that they experienced in the mm-hmm. town. Um, 
that I've never read anything like it. It was it was the most incredible um, narratives I've I've ever read, mm. and the the pride I felt to have been part of it. Um, I haven't got the words for. Just amazing, absolutely amazing. So proud, mm. so proud of of what the town um, produced for itself, really. So we've, we've talked a little bit about community there and obviously through your own experiences of life and you know even coming to that moment of feeling threatened outside your own house yeah. talk to me a little bit about early community for you and how you got to you know sort of where you are now and, and some of the challenges that you faced and and how did you get across and, and how did you move forward with those and, and what strategies did you because I, I guess because this is the whole thing that for me it's it's about letting people know that there are strategies out there yeah. we all have different coping mechanisms yeah, yeah. we all have different abilities to move forward but obviously even just your opening sort of gambit and some of the things you've thrown in to tell me about yourself yeah there must have been some real strategies played in there to make you go I need to do this, I need yeah. to change this. And, and what sort of challenges did you have within the community growing up and schooling and early life? Oh, well, well I, was, I was very lucky, I think, in that I went to a Steiner school, so a Waldorf. Mm -hmm. I had a Waldorf education, which, again, is based on the premise of head, heart and hands. Mm -hmm. That's how you learn, intellectually, compassionately, kindly, and actually by doing it. Um, so I was very lucky in that. While I was growing up, my dad was a vicar locally um, in Hina, and he rebuilt the church. I was part of the church community, but never really felt as though I fitted in, never really felt as I did. Um, and my, my, uh, there was me and my brother, who's a year and a month older than me, and he did all the things that um, older brothers do in terms of get a job in a pub as a pot washer, Get, get your first car um, or well, actually we were really lucky our parents bought us a car he taught me to drive so that I could drive him around on nights out so I, I learned to drive um, with lessons and, and with, under his supervision <coughs> um, and we lived a very full uh, life and challenged the notion of being vicar's children mm. deliberately I, though, kept feeling as though I didn't fit in um, and actually now know that I developed a bit of a crush on um, a teacher, a female teacher, my art teacher, um, and, um, and somebody else in the school who was older than me, a, a, a young woman who was older than me. And we were great friends and I was great friends with the teacher, but I didn't, I didn't associate the feelings that I had with it being a crush mm. or with my sexuality. Um, at that point because I'd grown up through the church and I'd always been told and read um, that homosexuality was wrong mm. and so that's so it was all internalized and it wasn't until I started doing my A levels and I met somebody on the first day in my English class and, and they went to church and I started going to their church instead of my dad's church um, and I absolutely fell in, in love with them mm. um, and was able to tell them. And that love was reciprocated, um, but they were also in a heterosexual relationship because that's what you did. Mm. And um, loving somebody of the same sex wasn't what you did because that's what it said in the Bible. Um, and that really affected my mental health because... It got very complicated and, and very nasty with the other the other person and their parents and they were sent off to Israel on a kibbutz um, and I um, had a gap year from my A levels before I decided what to do mm. and um, I met somebody I I worked as a schools worker for uh, a church in Hucknall and my supervisor I'm still in touch with him now told me straight out that he was bisexual and told me exactly what that meant i think actually he was pansexual um because pans people um uh when they're pansexual they fall in love with the person the the, the character of the person mm -hmm. um not not the sexuality or gender of the person oh, wow. so okay. that's what bisexual mm -hmm. people fall in love with the, the gender or sexuality um and he 
I told him about this relationship and how um, this person had been uh, sent off to a kibbutz and, and he said, are you gay then? And I, I couldn't answer, absolutely couldn't answer. Um, and he was actually probably the first person I eventually came out to. Um, and I started, go, he helped me get into university and the people I met at university always, it, well, not always, in my experience, changed changed my life. And I met other people that had had um, lots of different experiences that weren't all church-going Christians, um, met other gay people, male and female. Um, and my brother was also at university and he would come home and we'd go out. And he always wanted to go on the scene because they played better music. And... Um, Eventually, I was getting so so wound up and so upset about this person that was out in Israel. Um, Mum sat me down at, at, at the kitchen table and, and actually said, um, Sarah, the sooner you admit you're gay, the easier all our lives are going to be. So I think what and my dad, my mum and dad had split up by then. My dad had moved out to America and um, my dad, I think mum must have told my dad. Um, because he was then very <coughs> um, supportive, but waited for me to tell him about a new partner that I'd met. And um, literally by saying, well, when you come and stay, do you want to share the same bed or do you want to sing, uh, separate beds? And that was him asking me if I was gay. And I think really from, from that moment on, um, I realised that my family were at the heart of everything that I was and everything that I wanted to be as yeah. well because my, my dad was an incredible networker um, as, as a vicar, he was a community vicar he rebuilt the church he, he um, set up uh, an organisation called Salcare in Hina he came down to breakfast one day and said this is what I'm going to do and it's, uh, it's going to be called Salcare Salvage and Care uh, that was in 1977, I think, um, and I still remember it, and it's still going mm. today. It's still, you know, what what are we? September 2021. It's still going today. Um, my mum, a huge academic, um, you know, tell me the Latin or Greek meaning of the origin of any word, um, and and my brother was this incredible performer, communicator, networker. Um, who had the most incredible sense of humour, but also the, the the most stringent values that I've ever known anyone have. So he would shout at me if I'd um, bought something from Tesco instead of the co-op, or if I'd gone to Primark in, instead of um, John Lewis or something. Other brands are available. Other brands are available, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> um, so I think at that point, that was a key, key moment for me. So in terms of um, strategies in my life... Um, it was about going back and actually believing um, that my family loved me and understanding and feeling that my family loved me, even though we came from a religious mm. background. And I was a vicar's daughter. And But, but what my parents and my brother all said um, is, great, come on then, let's go and live our life. Mm. And I know how lucky I was. Um, and because of that, I've stayed in the church as an organisation and as a system um, at, to challenge it, to ch challenge it on its views around homosexuality. Um, and I, I will continue to do that. Yeah. I, I see the church as very separate to my faith. My faith is a personal relationship that I have with God. Um, and that's, that's about me, me and them. Um, the church is uh, something that is uh, made by people um, with rules and laws and policies that are written by people based on their experience of the world and mm. um, sometimes I think they pick and choose the bits of the Bible they want to believe in and they pick and choose um, how they're going to implement that and challenge that. So mm. family, family is a huge, huge motivator for me because I think it is about strategies but it's also about purpose. and. I I know I have to have purpose in my life. So my mental health often isn't very good. Um, and it's worse if I don't feel I have purpose. Mm. Um, and what do you do 
I, I know that when I get tired, I make very irrational decisions and very much my wife will tell you, oh, here he goes again. Oh, actually, just go to bed. You need, you need to go to sleep because wake up in the morning and it'll all be better. And that I know that my mental health suffers in that respect. So what do you do to get out of that mental health low? Um, I, I develop lots of stresses. I used to play my guitar and music a lot, which is one of the things we have in common. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I used to write songs an awful lot, and I did that as a career with young people for a while. Uh, music motivates me, and when I feel more motivated, that lifts, lifts my spirit. I surround myself with people who are doers, mm. um, people who see things in me that I can't see myself, um, people who challenge me, people who make me think or see things in a different way. Um, I married someone who does that. Um, so Mar Mar Helen challenges me and makes me think about things from a different perspective. Um, I think more recently, um, my brother, my brother was killed um, uh, almost eight years ago, seven and a half years ago, um, in a in an awful accident, um, but doing doing something that he loved. So he was a music promoter, and he promoted Adamant, um, Lloyd Cole and the Commotions, um, lo loads and loads of bands that um, you know the Water Boys. But and, he, and Fisherman's Friends. And Fisherman's we Friends. Must, we must must, yeah, no. And he was working with the Fisherman's Friends uh, on a gig. They just got to the Guildhall, um, G Live, and were unloading some of the gear. And he was walking around helping because that's what that's what he did. Mm. He liked feeling part of it. When the loading bay door failed and came down and crushed him and one of the band members, um, Paul died mm. uh, at the scene, and the band band member died two days later and I will I will never get over that mm. I he he and I um, I I followed I followed in his not in his footsteps but I lived his values um, we fought mm. like like nothing on earth but we always ended a conversation with I love you and um, the last conversation I'd had with him w had been about a review the Fisherman's Friends had had in The Guardian, and he hadn't been able to get a copy, so I got it up and read it to him. And it was really cross, because it wasn't very complimentary. Um, but he still said at the end, I love you. Yeah. And But it was, you know, that was the last conversation I had with him. But, so he died. Um, and that kind of losing somebody not being able to say goodbye completely out of the blue he was 44 um a young son who was six married um i haven't i haven't got the words to describe what that feels like other than shock um so you're dealing with the shock before mm -hmm. you're dealing with the grief um but because he was with a a, a fairly well-known band it was in in the press for a long time um and some of it was lovely but other bits were were dreadful so we we lived through that um my dad died two years after that um from cancer so again although he we knew he was ill he uh, he was more ill than he let on and mm -hmm. the 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 end of that was quite quite sudden and i think i'm telling you that because um grief you don't get over grief your life adapts to it I think, and your life will never be the same. My life will never be as it was before Paul was killed and Dad died. Um, but what I do, um, and I've still actually got my Dad's ashes because I don't know what to do with them. Um, and the way I deal with that grief and the way I deal with coping with my mental health is to do something in their memory every single day. Mm. So when I feel really low, really down, um, sometimes I just get out of bed in their memory. Mm. Um, you know, when when I'm feeling really energised and and well um, and inspired, um, I I stood so the, the pride event. I stood at the top of the high street and just thought, Paul would have loved this. Paul would have absolutely loved this. Um, 
Helen and I got married again, as you know, um, <clears throat> five years ago. And we were the first same-sex couple to get married in a place of worship in Derbyshire because we both have faith. Um, and it was a great day. And it was a great day. And the Unitarians did us proud. Mm -hmm. And they did us proud because they allowed people from other churches, so um, friends that, that were, were vicars and priests, uh, other churches around the country to really take the service. Mm. Um, so my, my, uh, the, the person that took over from dad, um, when dad w went to live in America in 1990, um, he, he's like, he's, he's a, such a, a great friend, he and his partner, um, he did the address and it wasn't a lovely soppy, well, I remember introducing Sarah to Helen back in nineteen <laughs> in two thousand and seven. It was in front of our father, <laughs> and we went to IKEA. It wasn't that, which is what Helen and I were both expecting. It was a we're here today, and that's brilliant. But we've got so much further to go, mm. and it's your responsibility. This is about you, each and every one of you. He did a sort of preachy Martin Luther King, mm. um, but for the LGBT community. And he got a standing ovation at the end of his sermon. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my brother's um, godfather um, opened the service with my nephew, my, my brother's son, um, who was one of my best men, by lighting a candle with um, the names of all the important people that should have been there but, mm. but weren't. And, you know, I think it's... it's the the purpose that I have in my life really does come from Dad's um, collaboration and knowing that that people deserve more justice than they get because that's really why Dad uh, was a community mm. um, vicar. Um, he and he worked out in the community more than in the church building. And um, and my brother's values around, you know. Um, being kind, putting family first, um, including people, welcoming people, recycling, um, doing the right thing. Um, and I think they influenced me when they were alive, but I've turned that, that influence into action since their death as a, as a way of coping with my grief, my, my loss of them in, in my life, because... You know how how do you cope cope with losing? How do you cope with losing your your brother and your dad mm. within two years of each other? So yeah, so uh, you know my strategies surround surround myself with people who see things in me that I don't see, who believe in me, um, who, and who will challenge me, um, but also don't just talk about making things better make them better mm. yourself get out there there's a lot in that there's, sorry yes no 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 i mean that that's what this podcast is supposed to be about you know it's people who don't know you and we'll see this for the first time you know we've, we've talked about <coughs> so much and we've talked you know we've talked about loss we've talked about pride we've talked about coming out for the first time and and developing an understanding of who you are as a person you know mm. there's like like i said at the beginning you are the most diverse person and we we could go on and this this could become a weekly podcast in its own right <laughs> the life of sarah <laughs> and i think i think the one thing that does stand out is the principle of community which is why yeah. i wanted to do these podcasts yeah absolutely embeds in you and, yeah. and you know and really starts yeah from you so that that is amazing so Let's let's go on to the long COVID part and, okay. and the currently where we are. I mean, we've talked sort of historical. We've talked about one of the the defining things I think that you know you stand for, and where we are today. Um, so you got sort of COVID earlier in the year, and that's developed into long COVID. Yeah, yeah. And so. obviously, knowing you um, and having conversations with you over this, I, I've seen you struggle, and and obviously you have other underlying health conditions which haven't helped. Talk to me a little bit about long COVID and, and sort of tell me where you are at the moment. Yeah, well, long COVID for me has been worse than COVID. I got, I 
I um, tested positive for COVID on the 18th of January this year, 2021, um, and probably had a, a moderate to mild dose of it. I wasn't hospitalised. Um, the para paramedics had to come out one one night, quite late, because I couldn't breathe well. Um, <clears throat> it it the symptoms just didn't get better, and so I was diagnosed with long COVID after about six weeks by my local practice and referred to the long COVID clinic in Derbyshire. Um, but the devastating thing for me um, was really um, the fact that it was on top of the other chronic conditions that I already had. So I already had fibromyalgia, which is a, a sort of nerve disorder pain um, condition. Um, a lot of arthritis and um, degenerative discs in my back. Um, and three years ago, um, it was uh, it was Sean who, as an OT and friend, kicked me up the backside and, and helped me get my head round, um, accepting the fact that I had those conditions and just learning to live differently. Yeah. Um, and I will be forever grateful for that because that's really helped me with long COVID. Um, don't tell Sean that, will you? Shh, don't. Sean. <laughs> Um, but uh, I had a chest x-ray after eight weeks and I had a partially collapsed lung, mm. um, a telectasis it's called, um, and after five months got to speak to somebody from the long Covid clinic, um, had another x-ray, the lung was still partially collapsed um, and they realised that my central nervous system, my autonomic nervous system, um, had been damaged and that is the system that um, it has two parts there's a sympathetic part which is the fight or flight so you're in a situation um, you need to react quickly your heart rate goes up your eyes focus um, in, in, a, in a linear way um, often you might get a, an upset stomach your breathing will increase um, versus the parasympathetic system, which calms all of that down. Mm. So my parasympathetic system isn't working well, so it means that my heart rate races um, and makes me very, very dizzy. Um, and I can't control my body temperature. I get a lot of pain in my chest. Um, devastatingly, I can't cry. Mm. So I, I just have enough tears in my eyes. Um, but the the, the process of crying, uh, the physical action of crying, my body can't do at the moment. Um, and I had the Delta variant of COVID, which affects your sinuses. Yeah. So um, it's affected my hearing. Um, and I found out two weeks ago that it's affected my hearing to such an extent that I've got to have two hearing aids. Yeah. Um, and at every stage, I've been off work as well for over nine months now, which I've really struggled with. Um, but when you're poorly, you don't get bored. So mm. people have said, haven't you been bored? And I, no, you know. Not got time to be bored. I haven't got, you know, when I haven't felt poorly, <laughs> yeah. I've been involved in Pride, and making Pride not just a one-off event mm. or other things. <clears throat> um, and you've used your network there as well to sort of help. Yeah. You've sort of facilitated that Pride event rather than actually doing, you've, you've I've, managed to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I wrote you in. Uh, I wrote Sean in for motivation. And just other people that, that um, could do things that I either hadn't got the energy to do because it's crippling fatigue that you get with long, long COVID um, as well. And, you know, being the great networker and collaborator um, reaching out through mm -hmm. social media as well as actually reaching out, um, almost uh, coordinating pride from from the snug in the in in the house, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you know I, I think which which shows um, some of the networks that I had established. It's very interesting that when I was first diagnosed with long COVID, um, the GP I spoke to said to me and I thought this was really flippant at the time and was a bit upset um, it's a good job um, 
you uh, have fibromyalgia um, because uh, you you will know how to manage a long-term chronic condition mm. um, and they were so right because what I found is that um, I've, I've used a model of acceptance really with long mm. COVID that it, my lung still hasn't healed so I still get very mm. breathless um, my hearing is it is a bit. Uh, people aren't mumbling as much as I thought they were. My hearing is 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 has changed, um, and what I have the energy to do and 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 don't do is uh, depends every changes every single day. But having that acceptance model um, where I can't cry, so what can I do instead? Um, you know, I I I I walk around the garden and I just go off on my own um, because otherwise I'll have a panic attack instead mm. of crying. Um, I can't hear, but being given hearing aids uh, will help. So I'll wear them then. Mm. Um, and doing all the things that I need to do to try and heal my um, central nervous system, um, I'll, I'll do them. Mm. Um, but I don't have a lot of other energy um, to fight other things from the outside. So I'm, I'm quite nervous about COVID in mm. the community still. Sure at the moment what what do you think is the <coughs> what's the what's the worst thing of it at the moment for you covid no the the long covid the symptoms that you have um not being able to cry really yeah because i'm i've, I've lost a lot again mm. um just not being able to see people seeing people again for the first time i i can't i can't sh i can't show sadness i can't show upset and frustration in the way that i'm used to i'm mm. a crier you mm. know i'm I'm, uh, I'm a i'm a sensitive emotional person um anger i would i would cry when i'm really angry not being able to cry um has been the most devastating even above hearing mm. loss mm. um for me um because it's 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 how I part of how I express myself is is I don't just cry all the time. Don't get me wrong, but um, it's then an emotion that builds up inside me, and I have I have no other way of, of getting it out. Mm. It's like needing to sneeze and getting to the point where you're about to sneeze, but you can't. But that need is still there, and mm. you have to talk yourself away from that sneeze. Mm. Um, so I've I've worried that it's making me. Uh, desensitizing me to things a bit um, but it means I've become chief onion chopper uh, in the house always a good skill yes I am onion technician in the kitchen um, I in the middle of the night I get bad headaches sometimes with the sinuses with my sinuses and I put some tiger balm on my head it's about three o'clock in the morning and it's it was a liquid tiger balm and it ran down into my eye so I had to wake Helen up because it was excruciating, excruciating in the pain that I felt. But again, there were no tears. <laughs> so my nose was running. I was in a lot of pain. Um, you know, if that isn't going to make me cry, I'm not sure what is. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I'd, I'd say that. And mm. I'd say also not being able to go to work because um, I've had to find a different way of... Uh, having an identity and not not sort of hiding behind not hiding behind but but living behind a title um you know of a role that i have at work mm. um so I've, I've had i've had to lose that and just be sarah um but that's actually something that i think probably needed to happen that i needed to have the confidence just to be sarah mm. not sarah the uh, diversity and inclusion lead at the University of Derby or Sarah the chair of Pride in Belper or um, so that needed to happen really I needed to be able to move away from that and, and have more confidence in in me yeah. um, I went out for the first time um, when I got the news about the hearing hearing loss and the need for hearing aids I walked out of it was it was the spec savers audiology department in Belper I walked out and I thought, oh, for, for heaven's sake. And I looked across and I saw 
the owner of uh, my favourite cafe in Belper. I won't name it. Um, and I thought, stuff this. I'm going for a coffee. So I went in there, saw, saw Andy, um, and he he hadn't seen me properly this year. Um, so he knew what a big deal it was, me actually being in the cafe. Mm. And uh, I told him what had just happened, and he, he got me sat down, and he came over and, and he talked to me with a mask on. And I thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, because actually being out in the community there are so many people that will protect me mm. as you know and have my back as well as me having their back mm. um you know from a from a inclusion perspective and i i went out again um on on friday and i went into a shop and into uh, the cafe again and felt a bit like i used to feel um, which was amazing so people have helped me do that. There's, there's a big phrase out at the moment that I hear quite a lot is "you are enough," and that's you know that that seems to be the the thing that people are starting to not not cling on to but realise, and that yeah that is definitely titles are great yeah but your you as you are definitely more defined as you than yeah. any title can ever yeah sort of give you so. Yeah. I would, I would happily just call you Sarah, <laughs> rather as you, than Prime Minister. As you do. Totally. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I guess, last sort of question then, really. With with everything and where we are, what's next? What's what's the, the sort of the next sort of... I, I'm not even going to go sort of future for Sarah. I mean, sort of the conversations I've had with other people are, you know, what's the future for you? And they've talked about what their dreams and ambitions are. I guess it's a little bit more short term for you. Where where do you see yourself? What do you want to do? What's the thing that you go? This this is this is the key. So uh, right now today, um, I had a really good chat with one of the clinicians at the Long COVID Clinic um, about a theoretical academic model that mm. I'd put to the approach that they use in their rehab in their Long COVID Clinic, um, and they were fascinated by this sort of academic approach to their practice or their praxis mm. it, it would be um, so I started writing uh, part of a paper um, they've asked me to write for um, with them wow. for, for two journals which is great because it's got my mind active mm. again um, and it's a, it's a brand new way of looking at this um, this this theory so I was doing that this morning um, there's a lot going on um, nationally about um, LGBT plus communities and conversion therapy in the Church of England or in the church generally. There are big elections coming up for the Church of England onto their general synod. So um, that's brought a lot of the LGBT Christians out on, on social media and they're, they're often people that have been very hurt um, by the church, not by God, but by, mm. by the church. And so, you know, I've just been... Um, chatting really with them mm. and uh, um, I mean this is a whole of the program but we were talking earlier weren't we about the fact that the word homosexual wasn't included in the bible until um, 1946 mm. um, and it actually replaced the phrase ch uh, boy child molester mm. um, so it's, it's the trajectory of, of where that's gone is, is very interesting so that's that's um, this week I get my hearing aids fitted on Friday, so that will be uh, a, a bit of an adjustment. And I'm trying very hard to get back to work mm. and have had some positive news um, about how I, I may be able to do that. So that's that's my they're my goals really at the moment. We've got a big house build happening, um, which I'm I, we, the builders are so amazing, um, Matt Keen. MK building. Um, so amazing. Other builders are amazing. <laughs> we are a non sponsored podcast. <laughs> non sponsored. <laughs> Matt Keen. Um, they've, they've been amazing in not only bringing our ideas to fruition with our architect um, who's just tested positive for COVID, um, but doing it in such a skilled and careful way 
but also being so kind mm. and asking such amazing questions about the LGBT community to the extent where um, they they made a makeshift flagpole and got a progress flag and uh, screwed it onto the top of it on their building site. Um, which just makes me feel joyful mm. and proud, bursting, bursting with pride. Um, so they're not they're not big things. Um, well, they are big things. Getting back to work will be will be mm. huge for me. Yeah, um, steps. Yeah, in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, there is a phrase: "You are enough." Um, I only feel as though I'm I'm enough when I'm doing what I need need to be doing mm. and I think you can be enough but we have a responsibility to make things better not just for ourselves but f but for other people mm. so um, be enough um, and but make things better mm. for everybody cool so I always finish with two or three fun questions different questions that yes are not serious because I think uh -oh. um, we've cleared an hour of recording so have we? Yeah. So, um, wow. which is great because there's so much in there. But just a few fun things. Favourite place to be? Cornwall or Staithes in North Yorkshire. Okay. Sunny days or rainy days? Rainy. Oh, love. I love the rain. Yeah. It, 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 for me at the moment, it's, 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 the world crying so I don't have to. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. And for those of you who are wondering what that noise is, Steve is um, Sarah and Helen's lovely dog. And he's decided I think he wants to be involved a little bit. So if you could hear his pattering feet, that's... that's the oh, well, here he is. Here's Steve. Here's the boy wonder. <laughs> oh. Steve. Hey, mate. Um, and I think, uh, do you know, I actually think that's the best place to leave it by introducing Steve, Steve. to the rest of the world. If, if it, well, not that he hadn't already been introduced, but this is Steve. So yes, th this is Steve, our beautiful disaster, <laughs> and, and at home in his best place. In his best place, Sarah. That's been a great conversation. Thank you very much for having me over to uh, to talk to you, and thank you for all of that information. Well, thank you for that being, you've been part to the world. That's it's just been a great listen for me and, and to be involved in listening to that has been fantastic so thank you thank you